Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. Happy Wednesday. Happy Hump Day. I'm Deanna. Good to see you. It's great to see you. I am in such a happy mood today. Why? What's going on? It's not particularly bright or what? I think it might be this pervading smell of maple all over the place because of these maple candles I bought. Feeling very seasonal. I hope things are going well with you this Wednesday morning. It is good to see you. Exciting news, a lot of exciting things to show you today. Donna, good morning, and Alberta, good to see you. Mom, I hope you're doing okay. I need a, I need a more thorough update from you, but it's good to see you. Crystal, good afternoon. Do you also have a donut? How do you fit a donut inside that tiny body with that gorgeous figure around it? I got my, I got my crystal sweater in the mail today. I'm not ready to wear it yet because it looks quite warm. But wait till you see it. It looks, it looks like a rug that you would make. So I'm, I'm very excited to premiere the crystal sweater. But it needs to be a little bit cooler than it is. Um, I also have something else crystal this morning. Suze, good to see you. You signed up for the Sugar Skull class. Fantastic. I'll send that stuff out today. I saw two or three people signed up yesterday. So we'll get going on that. I'm super excited. In your pack, you have so you're going to have so many colors. Uh, cut strips in two different sizes, eights and fives, and plus tons of the novelty. You know, I always put in a ton of novelty fiber, the eyelash stuff, mohair, um, thick wool, thinner wool, all kinds of different stuff so that you can experiment with that too. Um, so that'll be so much fun. It'll just be fun to be together so close to Halloween, having, having a nice time working on a project. Dave, good to see you. Gray and mellow in Toronto. Sounds like the, it sounds like the title of a book, Gray and Mellow in Toronto. Oh, Catherine, good to see you. Linda, howdy. Oh, good to see everybody logging on. Barbara, great to see you. Kirsten, happy Wednesday. Janice, happy Wednesday. Cold morning in northern Minnesota with the wood stove blaring. I like that part. Talk about nice smells, right? Nice seasonal smells. Lisa, good afternoon. Cloudy in Pennsylvania. Oh dear, oh dear. We are. It is not summer anymore. We can't. We can't even pretend that it's the end of summer, can we? Beverly, good to see you. You can't wait to see my sweater. <laughs> I don't believe you. I don't believe you. I stopped at Dunkin' Donuts this morning. I'm so rotten. I had Teddy with me, and uh, I stopped to get him a bagel twisted to get myself just a coffee. But you know how it goes, you know, when you get there and you roll the window down because I was too lazy to walk into the... And I ended up getting a sausage, egg, and cheese on everything bagel toasted like I always do. And I got two donuts, one for each of the kids and the bagel twist and an extra large coffee instead of the smaller one I was thinking of. I was not modest this morning at all. But um, I guess I'm still celebrating Canadian Thanksgiving. It's not legitimate at all, is it? So, Barbara, I have to say thank you so much. Barbara sent... Um, I think you said four, four of these Chatelaine magazines. Now, this is the famous issue of Chatelaine magazine that features Crystal's work along with her two buddies uh, who look like such cool people. Remember, we did this a week or two ago. The current issue of Chatelaine magazine, and this is a Canadian magazine. There's Crystal looking gorgeous. I don't want to hear about the belly. You eat those donuts. And then some other friends on other pages it was we looked at the whole article and it was fantastic it's a great article uh edit edit sorry Lo i love that piece i love that that piece is right up my alley but i'm just being a bit conservative on online you know um Chatelaine magazine barbara sent four to me so i have three extras i'm keeping this one for posterity of course it's going on my library shelf with all of my best stuff and um, I have three extras. So if you are looking for one of the Chatelaines and you're looking for it to come from within the U.S. in terms of shipping being like $3 as opposed to a ton more, send me a message, okay? Because now I have three copies. A la Barbara, thank you so much. And let's see. Oh, I didn't see Tara log on yet. And I had some Tara stuff to show. Oh, no. Maybe I'll give her a minute and see if she logs on late because I had some related related stuff there. Otherwise, I can just run it and, ah, now I'm torn. But you know what I did forget to show you yesterday? This little guy. I thought I'd forgotten him at home because I was working on, you know, I had my Magdalena sheep going and um, have not done anything more on that. I'm at a complete standstill with busyness right now. 
just existing and getting orders out, getting ready for the Vermont class this week, the Cape Cod class next week, lots of plugs, and um, massive deadlines with, with book projects and other stuff. So, um, Chrissy, happy coffee time. Coffee clubbers, I like that. It's, it sounds so hip, doesn't it? I love that. But I ended up finding, I think I was actually sitting on the Magdalena dog, Bride of Frankenstein, and I haven't... I haven't hooked around it yet, but you can see the top of the hair is like the Bride of Frankenstein. Can't help but think about Gene Wilder and Young Frankenstein. I can't help it. He's one, one, of my, one of my people that I really loved, Gene Wilder. But, you know, this is basically the exact dog that Magdalena did over and over and over. And I just dressed her up in a Halloween costume, or him. So, so easy to do because, of course, Magdalena, uh, Brian, or Eby's work is out of copyright. Um, you know, she lived in the in the mid uh, 19th century so it is super out of copyright but so fun to do something like this I have the big piece with all of the characters around the classic lollipop tree and then I'm hooking some of them or I was before I, I hit a wall um, individually and you know what I wanted to show you about this one is one thing that I did with this one that I thought made it work pretty well let me see if I can bring it in pretty close I haven't obviously blocked it yet because I'm not finished but you see how there's quite a bit of definition around the ear and then I did a little bit of a jaw thing here. It got darker down there and a little bit of definition here. And also, oh, this is reversed, the tail, right, on the edge of the tail. I got a few lines in there that I think helped. You, I'm going to obviously have a dark background, but I think helped with reading the face of the dog. And, you know, this is how I did that, in case you ever want to try this. If you do anything with dyeing, um, what I did was I have some braiding rolls, right? Some rolls that I use if I'm going to do braiding or I've got that kind of a project going means meaning strips of wool that are all, you know, wound up in a little coil, little cinnabon with the pin in it, nice and tight. Um, sometimes I, I decide I don't want to use them or I have too many because I tend to buy them every time I see them. Braiding takes obviously a ton of, um, of this kind of wool. So sometimes what I do is I just throw it into a raging dye bath. So in this case, I had beige, I had beige wool meant for braiding in a little coil. And I threw it into like a dark, I think this color actually was, um, I think that is, ult, what is it? Ultra, 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 ultra purple. I think ultra, it's a Dharma color. It's one of the large ones. I want to say ultramarine, but I don't think so. It might be deep purple. Um, in any case, I threw it in there. And because the thing is so tightly coiled up, the dye only hit the, the first sort of lap around the coil, but then the top and bottom. So the top and the bottom, just on the edge, almost like you're burning parchment to make something look old, like an old book, just around the edge got quite dark. And then I was able to, while I was cutting these into strips and stripping the piece of wool, I was able to choose the ones that I wanted that were just tinged with darkness just on the edge and use those for areas where I wanted a, v a very sort of subtle line and definition. I didn't want half and half. I didn't want mottled color. I just wanted one tiny bit of color on the edge. And that works great. That's a great technique for when you want just a little definition, but you don't necessarily want a different colored strip, right? Because then even a thin strip maybe becomes too graphic and too outliney for what you're doing. So it's a great idea, and even if you don't have those braiding things around, you could just cut up some wool, roll it into coils, and, you know, put a pin in it so it stays tight and it doesn't unravel because then it, the game, the jig is up, right? Um, and, you know, it'll take perfectly on the top and bottom, and then you have that choice to use those strips in this way, and I think it works, it works really well. So, little tip. Hey, you know what? I keep forgetting to say, send me your great tips. I want to have an episode next week, hopefully Monday, where we share each other's tips, right? So don't be stingy. I know nobody on this call is. That's why we're here, because we constantly share. But I'm going to share all of, the, all of the tips that are my best tips that you probably already know. And I'm going to share tips that Donna has sent me uh, from Whispering Hill, you know, the shop that I love, um, the rug cooking shop in Whispering Hill, uh, Woodstock... Connecticut, Donna Swanson, right? So um, I've got some of her tips. I've got some of my tips. And if, if other people send tips, then we will have a tip fest. We will have a tip-a-palooza 
um, and share things because we all know different things and we've all figured different things out. I think that would be a great episode for next week. It'll be a grab a pen and paper episode so that you can write down, scratch out the tips that you haven't heard yet. So thanks, Linda. It was, you know, it's just one of those, just one of those things I figured, just figured out with so much dying happening. Thanks, Crystal. It worked really well. It'll work well for anybody. It's super dying dummies 101. It's just one of those things. I figured it out and I thought just in case, you know, anybody needs this exact technique, it really worked well. I feel that it worked well. Um, so I'm excited today because, um, well, a couple of things. Um, on the YouTube video from, you know, I was reviewing the book last Friday, uh, Hooked on Tan Cook by Hedy Van Gerp. And um, Hetty wrote, and we were going back and forth, and I just felt very sort of excited and starstruck. And um, and then, you know, um, on the video, uh, Lucy Neatby, who is like the world famous, world famous knitter, wrote me. And I got all excited again and said, oh, uh, Hetty and I can't wait for you to come over to Tan Cook and visit. And I, and I started thinking, man, I want to go visit so badly, and I'm going to be so super starstruck, because they're both like, in my mind, such like big figures, you know, and be showing off and acting stupid, trying to fit in, trying to be one of the cool kids. But I was excited. And then this morning, just a minute before the show started, I got an email from Rug Hooking Magazine, from somebody at Rug Hooking Magazine who said, um, you know, let's work together, had some ideas, brainstorming some projects. But most importantly, um, they would like to offer my viewers, you, you, this group, immediate group here, 50% off on books and um, magazines, like past issues. I think that's amazing. So I just wrote back a minute ago, because it was literally five minutes ago, and said, it gave the information for the Facebook page, which is Rug Hooking and Punch Needle Club. But if you are not a Facebook person, I said, I'd love to have the code that I can give on the air, right? So people who do not like to use Facebook can still take advantage of that amazing offer, right? How exciting is that? There are a few artists on Tancook Island. Barbara, it sounds like it is it, the tiniest place in the world. It sounds like, you know, a James and the Giant Peach kind of a world. But there, there do seem to be a ton of artists there. And they seem to be big names. It's a bit intimidating and exciting. And it looks just beautiful. So, yeah. Yeah, exciting, right? Exciting. Um, but I'm really excited about that sale. And I'm excited to be able to put that up there because you know how many great books they have. Um, that Rug Hooking Magazine puts out. It's an extraordinary amount of titles, and they are all relevant. Even the ones that are older, published years ago, still super relevant, and they should all be in your library. So to get them for a bargain is an amazing gift, isn't it? That was exciting. So, Robin, good to see you. Oh, you know, I just hate to... I have something to show of Tara's, and she's not on live. I feel like maybe we should wait. Uh, well, we're not going to be on tomorrow, are we? Okay. So, Tara, I know you're going to watch this later. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. I got an amazing package. It had several things in it. Mom, there's a package for you in there um, that I have not opened. And I know it's the exchange rug, right, from Jean um, Coates' exchange on our Facebook page, Rug Hooking and Punch Needle Club, the six-inch mat. It's in here, and I have not opened that. And I also have in this amazing um, package that came this one, and it's it's the first Van Gogh rug, right? So we had like um, um, Barbara and I, Barbara, it's Barbara's idea, had this sort of soft ending for this project, the Van Gogh project of the end of November. Um, I would love to make it even softer just because of busyness. And I really want to throw myself into mounting this exhibit in person. So this is going to be the first rug. If you are working on the Van Gogh chair, um, and I would say anything Van Gogh, please let us see. Even if you're a beginner, it's going to be great. And it's a great feeling to have your piece up on the wall with other people looking at it and wishing that they made it, right? Even if it's your first piece, it's a great exercise in doing, in participating. It's a great confidence builder to do something like this. So if you are working on Van Gogh or thinking of Van Gogh, um, be in touch with me or with Barbara and we'll get you the information. It is on the Facebook page. It's also on ribboncandyhooking.com. But as soon as Tara is definitely live with us, I will open that up because I want to look at it together. But she sent me such a lovely surprise. No, Lisa, it was Erin. 
Um, she's part of the Magdalenas. No, I've written to her in the past um, to Deborah because I was trying to figure out with the Magdalena Trail. There are there's a couple of buildings on it, not just like outdoor sites. And I was trying to figure out um, if those buildings are open. Um, so I'm still kind of waiting to hear back on that because I do. It's not going to be before Christmas at this point with deadlines, but. Um, I do want to get to Pennsylvania ASAP, and it looks like I'll certainly be getting to Canada in um, May, because in May, at the Rug Hooking Museum, right, in Nova Scotia, the, the exhibit of Hedy Van Gerp's rugs will be on, right? They're putting that up for May, so I will certainly be there. And if there's any kind of an event when it, um, when it starts, I, I, pl I plan to be there for sure. That would be a big, big um heavily circled event on my calendar. Um, I would be so excited to celebrate and to be there for that. So lots of things coming up, but I do want to do that Magdal Magdalena Trail, and I might even want to do it in a more formal way where we invite, you know, each other and meet each other and get together to do it together and maybe plan a hook-in at the same time. So I was kind of looking for the hours on that because I know Deborah is a part of that group. It would be great. Oh, I'm definitely coming, Crystal. It was just last year. It was so spotty with the border stuff, but I am definitely coming. And I'm going to have to, I'm going to loop in a lot of stuff. The Rug Hooking Museum, certainly. Of course, I want to go check out Deanna Fitzpatrick's um, studio. Um, I want to I see some outdoor stuff. I want to eat some food. I want to drink some drinks. And I want to hang out and do some hooking with friends up there. So I'll probably be up there for a while, when right around May, when all that's happening. So Tara sent me some treasures from Canada, and this is the thing that she sent. This is the thing that she sent for me because, you know, whenever you see something wrapped in brown paper like this, it had a, had a note on it too. Um, oh, it was an, on a card. Um, it's just so mysterious to get a brown paper package, isn't it? It's like a parcel from the past. She sent me this. You sweet, sweet angel person. I just love you, and this is so beautiful. I'm so happy that she sent this. She said she found it in a 120-year-old barn in, Ar I think, Argoyle, Ontario. Uh, is that right? Is that a place, Argoyle? I think she said Argo Ar Argyle, like Scotland, Arga. I think that's I think that's what she wrote. But I absolutely love this because do you know what this is? This is one of the... Oh, there you are, Tara. You have a sick puppy today? Oh, is, let us know that everything's okay, though. Just feeling sick, right? Just temporarily sick. Look what I'm holding up right now. And you know why I love this? Because this is one of those um, souvenir rugs that would be hooked and put into a shop for tourists. And besides that, it's got it's like, it's like actually on a sack because you can see some of the print on this sack. But these, you know, we rarely see these in the U.S., these small size mats. Um, occasionally you see coasters, but you rarely see a mat this size. Um, this definitely looks like Chetty, at least Chetty Camp's style. This is just amazing, and this is something we talk about all the time. I am so in love with this. But Tara, now I'm really hoping that the puppy's okay. I, absolute, I absolutely love the rug. And I love, she also sent these beautiful images. This is from, we've, we've talked in the past because we've talked so much about Emily Carr, the great Canadian artist, and, you know, her... Uh, hook drugs because she was also a rug hooker. Uh, there's always the debate when I say it, not in this group, about cultural appropriation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I love those rugs. I stand by those rugs. That art, anybody that hooks those rugs, I carry some of those in ribbon candy hooking. I think they are a beautiful expression of her very close and often living with relationship um, with, with native people of um, Canada. So we've often talked about Emily Carr because of the rug hooking, but talking about Emily Carr also brings up conversations Canadians will know about the group of seven and images like this, right? This is just A.J. Casson, Summer Hillside. Some beautiful images. We often talk about this group of artists, uh, Lauren Harris, Snow, but we rarely see these images. Uh, some of these names are not super well known to Americans, and it's a shame because these are obviously s such great artists. Um, this is McDonald, J E H McDonald, and Tom Thompson, who is maybe the most famous of the group. Absolutely beautiful images. But yeah, I was doing with the Emily Carr research a little research on the on the group of seven: Tom Thompson, um, Franklin Carmichael, Edwin Holgate. 
um, names that I think are much more, you know, much better known in Canada, but still very important. Frederick uh, Varley, very important names to know in art in general, and images like these that are that transfer so well to rug hooking. So beautiful. Just feeling sick, we hope. I'm sure it's just feeling sick, right? Just having an off day, just like we all do. Tara, thank you so much. Tara, is it okay if I open the Van Gogh rug now I know you're here? I didn't I didn't want to do it without you. Um, but let me know. If you say it's okay, I will open the Van Gogh rug too. Still, It's still locked up. Um, but yeah, oh, pup. And I won't open my mom's. We'll save that. So I'll see what she says. I have it on my lap. And in the meantime, you know, we were talking yesterday. We were finishing up the sort of chapter that we were going over the, the Burnett rugs, right? And how interesting it was that this company, who is a very mainstream supplier and advertiser, went on such a bender starting to show really atomic era 1950s rugs. Very specific, very modern. And one of them was, because I want to cross over here, one of them was um, one that I said, look at that. Doesn't that remind you of inkblot painting or psychology, psychiatry? Um, Oh, Tara, I will. I'm just going to do that, and then I'm going to loop back to that Van Gogh rug. Remember when we looked at this one here, I said, gosh, isn't that, for people that think they can't design, isn't that a fantastic composition? Uh, 1953 catalog I've got in my hand from Burnett, rug manual. Um, this was just a super ink block composition, and then we were saying, um, you know, if you have like a piece of paper, fold it in half. This is such an old-time thing, and it makes a blob on both sides. It's very symmetrical. Uh, makes a design that looks almost exactly like that. Well, I was transitioning to the book that I want to look at a little bit today. This is one of the many coffee table books I have, and I buy them always when I see them, particularly when they're cheap, because they are always loaded with black and white images of houses that m might not still be there, ominous thought but true, and um, could still be open to the public, like for tours, the historical society could have, some preservation or historical society could have acquired them. And when I look at these books and I spot hook drugs, I go crazy because then I need to get online, search the organization, search the name of the house, figure out who owns it, what has become of the house in the last, I mean, 70 years. This, I think, is another... No, actually, this is later, 1976, so I'll have a better chance with this. But, you know, it's still a bit of an older book. I was four when this book came out. Some of these houses, God forbid, might not be there, but we hope that the rugs will be. So I always grab these when I can, and you should, too, for your local areas. Try to keep, try to, you know, eyeball where the rugs were at one time and see if you can get on that crazy wild goose chain chase thing with me and follow up on whether these organizations exist and whether they still hold some of these rugs. So I found this one, and it looks like one of these ideas, the Bush Holly House, uh, built in 1685 in Cascob, um, New York, uh, Connecticut. Sorry, Connecticut. It's right on the New York border. It's one of those very expensive commuting towns because it's very close to New York City. But this is the rug that I spotted. If you Let me make sure we're in focus here from this house, and I haven't had a chance, but you know this afternoon I'll write them right there. Got a bit of a shadow, but you see what I mean? It's a very, very similar composition to the Burnett 1953 that I just held up, which also begs the question, could this be a newer rug? Put it in an older house, because these are black and white photos of a book that came out, now we know, 1976. This actually could be sort of a takeoff of the Burnett rug. This is this looks hooked to me. This looks low pile, whereas the Burnett kits were latched. Doesn't mean they couldn't have been done looped as opposed to clipped or latched. But it's a very, very similar composition. It really got me thinking. Um, number one, what an easy composition for beginners because you're basically folding, doing something like this, even if you don't want to spill ink, you can do something like this, and then you're just doing hit or miss, sort of concentric circles or squares around your shapes, right up the rug, rows of them, just rows of them. It doesn't get any easier than that unless you are doing the old school find a postcard, trace it, push it up a little bit diagonally, trace it again, push it up a little more diagonally, trace it again. Maybe that's the easiest kind of rug making design to do. But this looked pretty straightforward, and I thought, 
so interesting because, of course, uh, a 17th century house is not going to contain any authentic hooked rugs since we know rug hooking, the earliest kind of a date we can give it is the 1840s. But when people decorate their houses because of, we so often talk about the colonial revival in, in this country, in the U.S., and during that time, uh, with the help of, I think, Wallace Nutting a little bit earlier, people liked to decorate their house, an older house, in the style of. And they just presume, presumed and assumed that hooked rugs were part of that. And we know now that they weren't quite that early. But it does mean that people littered the floor with these beautiful hooked rugs during that period of interest, the colonial revival period. And this book hits squarely on that. So when I opened this book, I started flipping through it with great interest. I found so many old rugs that as soon as I can breathe and think and uh, move about freely without huge time constraints, I'm going to be in touch with every single one of these houses to say, listen, this one is, let's see which one this is. You, and if you do it ahead of me, let me know how it turns out because it sure ain't going to be this week. Highland House with an H-Y-L-A-N-D, Highland House, Guilford. That's very close to where I live. This beautiful one up in the attic. Check this out. I think this is just a gorgeous image. Let me make sure we're in focus. So it's over here. This is an attic view. Beautiful rug right there. I'm trying to get you even closer. And to me, it almost looks like, I'll try to be still. It's hard to hold it so still. It might be a dog upside down. Do you see a face upside down, almost with a bow on it kind of thing? I thought it could be a dog. It's very, very hard to tell, and I know I'm not doing a good job of doing steady hands. A little too much coffee coursing through my veins. But um, I thought there was one other item of interest in this picture. Beautiful um, bed cover, but no, that's the only rug. But, you know, it did. I'm curious about this one because it does look a bit like a dog to me, unless I'm losing it uh, too late, right? But... I'm going to write them and ask them about this. This is a 1720 house, and this was the garret, so it was the attic. And it looks to me, just judging from the things that are up there, I mean, there's a spinning wheel up there. What a place to spin, huh? Um, I'm going to ask them because often servants would live in the attic, of course, but also children, right? So it could easily have been a children's room with a nice, quaint rug like that um, with a dog on it. it could be a very um, pliable sort of definition there. So there's lots of braided rugs, which I also love, but I love to show you the hooked rugs. This is Tom, the Thomas Lee House in East Lyme. I love East Lyme. Um, Lyme is also where the Florence Griswold House is, and I've been in touch with them because I know at one point they had a few hooked rugs down. But this one here, the Thomas Lee House. And this is, I just said it, now we're seeing it. This is when you push the postcard across. You get this sort of semi-log cabin. It's literally done by pushing a postcard or any kind of square or um, right angle diagonally right across. And you just get square after square after square. And then you just run your hit or miss strips right around. That's all that is. What a beautiful room, huh? What a beautiful, mysterious room with all these panels. Oh, I just love that. So that's another beauty. Let's see. There were so many in here. I'll never be able to show you all. Hempstead House, H-E-M-P-S-T-E-D, New London, Connecticut. This book is just um, southern New England. And they had, what did they have? I didn't bookmark it. Oh, Lord. They had this one. So this is another garret upstairs room, but it's, it's being used as a bedroom. So I'm going to say garret instead of attic. They have a bed rug on the bed. And look at, they've got like a, looks like a nitty knotty next to it, but it doesn't have both sides. So somebody's got to tell me what that is on the floor. What a vignette. Doesn't that just get you? Look at the paned windows. Look at that sort of um, Pennsylvania Dutch chest all painted up. Isn't that something? Look at that bed rug. Now remember, we did a whole week on bed rugs, I think two or three weeks ago. And that was a great, that was a great segment too. Um, and it really put forward the idea, the bed rugs are out there. They're not as easy to spot. They're certainly, I've never seen one like at an antique store. I've seen them in uh, historic houses, but I've never seen one in an antique store. So certainly they're less common, common than a hooked rug. 
but that one is a masterpiece. If anyone else is in Connecticut and you want to follow up on these, I'm not, I'm not sort of deferring or, or shirking because I, I would love to be in touch with all these people. But you are welcome to join the quest too if you would like to. Uh, the main thing is to find out whether they still have these rugs. And you know, it's just interesting as you go through a book like this, I'm going to show you the Bush Holly House in a minute. When you go through a, a book like this and you see these older homes, you see how the furnishings always lean toward Eastern style rugs, right? I mean, really, it, it, it's such a thing. The idea of having that, th a rug that would cost that much from such a faraway place really ticked all the boxes as far as wanderlust and the sort of um, then current obsession with travel and faraway places. Having these really uh, large Eastern rugs on the floor was a status symbol. But the hooked rugs we're seeing more in the attic and in the bedrooms, right? Um, Carrie says, so mad. I was supposed to remind, oh, I was supposed to remind, oh, well, you know, you are just a little late. We are still going strong for a few more minutes, and then you can always watch the rest later. But we missed you, and I'm happy that you're there now. It is frustrating when the computer does not do things that it's supposed to do. That is for sure. Now, that's the one I just showed you, uh, that first one that really looked like Burnett's ink blots. Oh, this is a nicey. Let me show you this. This house has this house had several. This is the Knapp K N A P P Tavern, uh, Putnam Cottage, 1690 in Greenwich, and they had a couple out. Let me show you. I'll show you a couple pictures from this house. This one has a lovely one in a bedroom again. So context. This one here. See that one right in front of the hearth. What a quilt, too. A night, day, or light, dark Amish type log cabin quilt. Looks like all solids, very fine. See the pan. Um, so, this is a good clue it's a bedroom because sometimes the bed would be in the downstairs, you know, for reasons of um, space, if it's a very small house, reasons of mobility, right, depending on who's sleeping in it. But you see, there's the, the warming pan here that you would put the coals from in the oven and then put it under the mattress so that, or, or under your bed cover at least, so that your bed was heating up. This is a charming little rug, very old school traditional. And I have no thought that that's a super early rug. Um, but it's, you know, it's probably, it could be early 20th century, but very traditional design. It's not anything like the house is. Another log cabin over here, I guess, unless that's the same. Well, that could be the same, right? That could well be the same. It looks like there's a rug here that got cut off. That's definitely a different room. Don't you love these kinds of bedspreads? Does anybody know what those are called? That's not like Swedish huck or something like that, is it? these kinds of wovens, because I know I've seen them in Vermont t country store type stores, and they're always extraordinarily expensive for a thin bed cover. And I'm thinking that must be something, I just don't know what it is. I'd like to find out uh, so that I can justify the expense of buying one, right? I've seen them for the table too, uh, table runners, and they're just a very distinctive um, uh, woven, really different. Now, this is a beautiful rug. This isn't a, oh boy, there's two here. Let me tell you what house this is in case you're going to do the wild goose chase. Uh, Denison House, D-E-N-I-S-O-N, in Mystic, 1717. So this caught my eye right away, this beautiful braided rug. You know, I'm just, I absolutely love braided rugs as well. But then I just caught this little devil right here. And I was that ever a little devil. Now, you see what they've done there. It's a, it's a hearth rug in that it's in front of the hearth. But they have done, this has got to be an original design, a small central panel that we cannot see well enough to be able to make any sort of guesses about the subject. But huge big border, huge big border, really interesting dimensions. And let's see if I can get a little bit closer. There we go. A lot of hit or miss. So florals in the center, very symmetrical. And look at all that crazy hit or miss, almost like a crazy quilt around the edges throwing in diagonals, not just ups and downs, diagonals and shapes. Like, see this thing here, this white cutout right here? So different, isn't it? So different. Um, I would love to find more books like this of, of all places, just so that we could look and say, there we go, there's another one, Judson House, uh, J-U-D-S-O-N, 1723, Stratford, Karen's in Stratford. Karen, you're in Stratford. This rug, again, very traditional, right here under the table. But at one point, it was in this house, 
and I wonder if it still is. That's a beautiful scroll design. The, that really could be an heirloom or, a, you know, um, a heritage pro McGowan. It could be any of those. Not that I'm putting those down. Um, I just like seeing the originals, you know, the original designs better. They have a bit more, um, I think, history pizzazz. So Judson House, okay, Judson House is, is hot on the list now because I just found that one was downstairs. Did you notice that one was under the dining room table? Now, these are upstairs rugs, and these are absolute killers. It looks like they're showing the same one twice. All right, they are. They're doing a bit with vignettes, but check this out here. Isn't that lovely? And they're showing it here. That's certainly the same rug, but that's okay. They're, they're doing stuff with photos. The one that I really want to look at is this one, right next to the bed, because you know what this is. This is one of these, this is one that's a bit more rare too. Let me try to focus. It's one that's hit or miss hooked in the center. There we go. And braided a ton around. God, I love finding these. A nice hooked center, and then it's always a question of how nuts did they go braiding around the border? Pretty nuts, because that's a full-size mat right there by the bed, right? And then look how much more rug they've attached with the braiding. Isn't that spectacular? I just love these. I've loved these hybrids, these old hybrids of rugs. Uh, it makes it twice as interesting in my mind. I'll show, I'm a little, I'm over as usual, but I'll show you one or two more so that we feel satisfied that we know what rugs were once in historic Connecticut homes. The Hanford Silliman House. Now, you know what? I have been in touch with them a ton. Um, I'm going to show you the rugs that they have. She, I forgot she wrote me not that long ago about doing a, a talk there, which would be nice. New Canaan, Connecticut. Um, and they also have, what is it? Is it Aug Aug Augusta? Augusta, ah, not Penniman. Augusta, might be Penniman. Um, beautiful folk artist associated with that house. They have a large collection of art, very much in the style of Maud Lewis or Grandma Moses, uh, Augusta, I want to say Penniman, I'm, I'm probably wrong, but I wanted to check that out because um, I wanted to show you those images and we talked about my turning those images into rug hooking designs um, that would be super unique because she's not a well-known artist, but she is associated with this house in terms of living. And at one point, there might be some more cross crossover here because this is the beautiful house itself. No, that's what I like about Connecticut right there. Um, these two rugs here, yeah, this is a house I'd like to get inside of, and are those the same rugs? Those might, you know what, they might be playing, playing us again. Those might be the same rugs, but at the end of the day, there's at least two rugs. Yeah, there's at least two rugs. No, they're not the same. At least one is different. So we'll see. I can go, I'll go check that out because that's on the list to do. They've got beautiful uh, wallpaper covered band boxes too. Those are crazy to collect. So lots on the radar. Oh, oh I almost said a bad word. Another one in the same house. There's two up in the bedroom. You see that, that cute one next to the bed? Let's look at that real close. That doesn't look like a commercial pattern to me at all. It looks like someone was trying to copy a commercial pattern. Maybe did the flowers a little bit too big and then squeezed in some scrolls on the side. Perfection. But oh, man, look at this one. That is good. Very geometric sort of, obviously handmade type design in the center. It looks quilt inspired. Yeah, Crystal, this is just an old book that I found at a bookstore. It's called Historic Houses and Interiors of Southern New England. Sorry, Southern Connecticut. Very specific. Um, but just making the point with this book that there are so many rugs in it that it's crazy. And we don't even know at all whether these rugs still exist or whether the houses still exist. So just making the point that in terms of documenting rug hooking history, the part that we all can play is we can keep our eyes like really popped wide open for local periodicals, particularly older ones, to show us where, if the rugs are not now, where at least they were. Because they're often rolled up um, in the attic and might come out again if someone says open sesame, right? So just, just a, a quest, an invitation to start exploring. 
This is the Keeler Tavern, K-E-E-L-E-R, in Ridgefield, Connecticut. And they actually had a hooked rug. I don't know if it was ever on the um, floor, but this is their hooked rug. Very patriotic one with an eagle. You bring it closer. Isn't that fantastic? So, all kinds of places. This is a tavern as opposed to a home. I think there was one more. Yep, this is the last one. The Okay, the Florence Griswold House. So I did already write to them about this because I did have a little bit of an entree there. I've done stuff with them in the past with other, other projects. But um, this is one that they had that I just went like cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Beautiful basket. I mean, doesn't that look like a Claire, Claire Murray-ish rug? I mean, it's very long, so it's got more of the hearth rug shape. But what a thing. This is such a beautiful house. You know, the Florence Griswold House, I'm sure if you're from here, you know, it was like one of the sort of cradles of American um, Impressionism. Probably the most famous artist to go through was Chilta Hassam, super famous. Such beautiful work. But the artist at this house, you can tour the house because uh, she used it as a boarding house, the Florence Griswold House. It was built by her dad, who was a whaler, and she was kind of left with it, and it was kind of falling apart with, you know, for lack of a man being on the scene at all. And she ended up having to take in boarders. And it became a great retreat summer retreat for quite famous artists coming from New York, starting with Henry Ward Ranger, who's a famous tonalist, meaning he, he painted much darker, like think Rembrandt dark. Um, and he did everything. Everything was, was by tone, right? It was all about the tone. But they were very dark paintings. So when the Impressionist artists started coming from, from New York, the newfangled, you know, youngins, and uh, taking root like every summer in the Florence Griswold House, there was a lot of tension and animosity between the artists because they represented two polar opposites, two completely different schools of painting. Uh, but it is a beautiful house to tour, and we know that at least one hooked rug was present in that house back in the day. So I haven't heard back from them. Let's do this now. Let's do this now. Let's unveil the first Van Gogh rug. So this is... Um, here's my Van Gogh's chair in, Cl in Klimt's garden under a starry night. Uh-oh. Oh, this is going to make me crazy, isn't it? I'm not going to rip your writing either. I'd like to see your writing. Holy mackerel. Tara, are you kidding me? Oh, my word. crazy is that Tara this is like this is unbelievable this is unbelievable I love it I can see the Klimt down here look at that seat cover you wove it like a real seat holy mackerel that is that is so good Van Gogh's chair Right, so this is the first thing that's come in. What a home run. I like, the, I like the way the moon looks, right? That is just wow, wow, wow. Exactly, Crystal. Wow. Oh, Tara, this is unbelievable. And I love the crossover with Klimt, too. That is just unbelievable. Message on the back. Oh. Van Gogh's chair in Klimt Garden under Starry Night. Oh my God, that is amazing. That is amazing. I love it. I love it. That is fantastic. Well, we know where that's going into the exhibit that I have that I am actively planning. I am actively planning. I just want to be sure we have plenty of rugs to go in there. I want to finish mine. I want to look at this close up. Um, Tara, is it okay if I take a picture of it and put it in our Facebook group too, just to remind people that we're doing the challenge, even though it's a very protracted challenge? Um, I just can't believe how good this is. Let me just show you the seat again because there's some, there's some, oh God, I love it. There's some depth things going on. Isn't that cool? Just, isn't that cool? Oh, that is so good. I bet it's nice to see it again too. I am so ashamed that it took me so long to open that package. I just, I don't know what it is. I'm like, I'm like 
crazy every time I walk into the house. I'm, my craziness is renewed and I lose track of everything. This is absolutely gorgeous. So what a great way to end that episode. Now, I just want to read your comments. It is so beautiful, so well-deserved. So just a reminder, I love everything. Thank you so much. Um, just a reminder, I won't, I won't be with you on Friday night. I'm so sorry. It is definitely time for bingo times, um, but I will already be in Vermont for teaching on Saturday. So that class is filling up. I think there's one spot left in that class if you're thinking about it. That class is, is getting pretty, pretty maximum um, as of yesterday. So I'll be up there already, and I'm so sorry about that. The next week, I will be on Cape Cod, so I don't know if I'm going to leave the night before yet, but we will talk about bingo on Monday, and I will be back with you on Monday. And in the meantime, I'm going to sort out the code from Rug Hooking Magazine so you can get uh, your discount on their books and past issues. And you know every single one of them is fantastic, and all of their books too. I was talking about the magazines, but the books too. So much inspiration, right? And for that price, that's a, that's a crazy price. You do it that way, and you don't have to deal with Sometimes people on the buy and sell pages can be difficult or persnickety and ornery and um, whatever. I've had a lot of bad experiences. So it's nice to buy straight from the source and to get that kind of a price. So I will make sure that that pops up both on um, the Facebook page, Rug Hooking and Punch Needle Club. Once I have the code, I will put it in the description of this video, today's video, since I won't be with you again until Monday. Um, and I'll also put the code on Ribbon Candy Hooking on the front page of Ribbon Candy Hooking, my shop. So all of that will happen in the next few days. Please be looking out for the few new things that I've put out recently just to try to bandage axe wound it with, with the holidays coming up and being as busy as I am. I wanted to at least put some things out there that were new for you to check out if you wanted something new from me. I'm sorry I haven't been as productive as I usually have, but it will all pay off in the end, I promise. Otherwise, have a great weekend. Um, I know we're still on hump day, but I'm projecting forward knowing I won't see you until Monday. Have a great weekend. I will be on the lookout while I'm in Vermont for treasures. And if I see any treasures, you know I'll put posts up in the Facebook group so that if, I, if there's things that I left and I leave most things because of money and um, common sense, uh, I will always post rugs as I find them and tell you where I found them. So if you're up there and I see something great and you want to run over and grab it or you want to call them and have them ship it, I'll show you anything that I find that's exciting. I'll show it to you in these days that we're not together. And in the meantime, be busy. Yeah, I think well, I think people would love to see it. And I think it would just remind people that this is going on because there have been about a thousand, at least a thousand new people in the group since we, we posted it in the first place. So those people might be itching for a next project and this could be a great project for them. So, all right, how long? Oh, Catherine's saying, how long did that take you to make? Looks like it's cut. Well, there's a lot of yarn, isn't there? There's a lot of everything. Looks like the cut, are you doing a, um, like a four when you're using wool strips? I'm showing it close up because it's perfection. This is the, this is a photo of the how to. That is so good. Hmm. I was just waiting to see if Tara wrote back. With Pup being sick, she might be a bit distracted today. I'll put it up on the page, and I'm sure she'll answer. Um, how long did that take you to hook? She's she's very fast. She's super fast. Well, thank you so much. I will log off. i got to finish up some orders and do some stuff. But look out for those things in the places I just mentioned, and have a great weekend. I will see you on Monday, and I'm so looking forward to it. Lots of busy times between now and then. But we will build a bridge, and I will see you again on Monday for coffee time. Oh, about <laughs> uh, about a month. And yes, cut number four. Excellent. Good. So about a month. That is a remarkably fast time for a piece that intricate. And I know you're working on other stuff, too, because you're always multi-busy and multitasking. So, all right. Well, have a great afternoon. I will see you all on Monday, uh, noon Eastern Standard Time, Ribbon Candy Hooking Channel. Take care, everybody. Thumbs up.